Hi, my name is Gabby Munoz, and I'm a Bates graduate of the class of 2007, and I'm currently a wildlife care specialist at San Diego Zoo Global. I'm basically a zookeeper at the San Diego Zoo, um, and I thought I'd do a quick video for you guys on intro to dog training and animal training in general. It's a big part of my career, and um, I'm a big advocate for um, animal welfare and different ways that we can come up with to make our pets' lives and the animals that we care for in a zoo setting the most comfortable and um, most comfortable way that they can thrive possible under our care. So there are lots of ways that people go about animal training. Um, the one that seems to be the most progressive and scientifically sound based off of the research is positive reinforcement training. So a lot of people are confused about what that term means. A lot of people think it's, oh, you're just nice to your dog, and you give them lots of treats when they do things. Uh, but actually, positive reinforcement training is one of four types of conditioning um, that we learn about in our animal learning class. Um, there's positive punishment, there's positive reinforcement, and then there's negative reinforcement and negative punishment. It's basically a quadrant, um, but they basically can work in tandem with each other. So if you have positive reinforcement, you can also have negative punishment. So an example of positive reinforcement would be giving your dog a treat every time they sat for you in hopes they would do that behavior again in the future. Uh, an example of um, negative reinforcement would be, I'm sorry, negative punishment would be when you give someone a timeout for misbehaving in hopes that they won't do that behavior again, again in the future. So um, ideally, you want to focus more on um, rewarding your dog for things that they do instead of punishing your dogs for something they do. Um, unfortunately, there's some misnomers from other trainers like Caesar Milan that believe that um, dominance-based training and punishment-based training is the way to go, just based off of this old idea of wolf hierarchy. Um, a lot of that old wolf research has been disproven. Um, a lot of that whole alpha, omega hierarchy systems just don't seem to hold up once more research was done. So it's not to say that there aren't hierarchies. It's not to say that there shouldn't be a good working relationship between you and your dog and that you guys shouldn't have respect for one another. Um, it's just there are different ways to establish that and communicate that with your pet instead of using things like electric shock collars or prong collars or um, basically hitting your dog if they're misbehaving, things like that. So we try and avoid those things and set our animals up for success. Um, whether it's in a zoo setting where we only use positive reinforcement training for the most part and um, with our pets we try and do the same. So um, all that being said and done, if you have a more severe problem with your pet such as um, severe separation anxiety or severe um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which can look like dogs chasing their tail obsessively or licking themselves obsessively or chasing shadows or shiny reflections. Um, those are all things you're going to want to see an animal behaviorist for. It may or may not include the use of medication. Um, you would want to see a veterinary behaviorist for that. So if you have any questions about that, you, if you want to email me directly about more severe behavioral issues, other things like aggression, um, I'm more than happy to help. I'll give you my um, personal email address at the end of this where you can contact me if you have any more specific dog training or cat training or bird training questions that you might have at home. Um, at the zoo, I work in the mammal department. I work with everything from tiny speaks gazelles to large elephants to large carnivores such as mountain lions to other random mammals like giant anteaters and capybaras. So um, I've worked with a wide variety of animals at other zoos. I've also worked with... Um, birds such as penguins and trumpeter swans and reptiles and uh, just you name it, I've probably worked with that species of animal. Um, so let, to get started, how do you do positive reinforcement training with a new animal or maybe you have an old dog at home and you want to teach them a new trick? That's totally possible. You want to find something that is reinforcing for them, something that is rewarding. For most animals, the easiest thing to use is food. So for instance, um, Hot dogs that are pre-cooked, you can cut them up into tiny little pieces and use them as training treats. You can, um, if you need something high value and you want to make sure there's only a single ingredient in there, if your dog has some sort of food allergy, I highly recommend canned chicken. You can buy this at Trader Joe's for like a couple of bucks. Um, and then you can buy treat and train treats. They're really low calorie. There's only um, 
like one calorie per tiny training treat in here. You can buy them discounted. I think I got these at Marshall's um, for $4.99. If you want to get a big bag of these soft um, jerky strips, you can see my dogs are very familiar with them. Um, it look like this. They come in beef or lamb flavor. This big bag is probably $12 at Costco. So it's another great way you can um, find something reinforcing. You just want to break up these treats into little tiny pieces. Basically, you want to find a quantity that's small enough to motivate your animal where they're going to want to work for you um, without getting full too quickly. So if I had a tiny chihuahua, I would break these up into even tinier pieces um, compared to a cocker spaniel or a great dane. So um, just make sure you have something that your animals are really willing to work for. So as you can see, Wiley over here is competing with Brando for attention and for treats. So he pushed Brando up onto the couch. Brando knows he's safe up on the couch. So um, one thing that we found out during COVID is that uh, there was increased cases of aggression between animals in the same household. And we don't really know exactly why that is. The veterinarians that I've spoken with and other behaviorists, we seem to think that it's due to um, the owners being home more. And so the pets have something new and novel at home while everyone's working from home to compete with other pets in the house for that sort of attention. Plus, lots of people now that they're home have adopted a ton of uh, cats and dogs and new animals in the house. So you're trying to acclimate a new cat or dog into your resident pets that you have, um, which can cause a lot of tension. So again, those are some things that we can go into. Um, but right now, I just want to um, talk about how to start off training. So once you find something that's rewarding for your animal, like these training treats, I'm going to grab a few here, break them up. And then I have a little silicone training pouch here that clips right to my belt, super handy so that your treats are right there next to you on your hip, ready to go when you're ready to train. So when I'm training an animal, I want to kind of have a neutral position with my body. I don't want to keep my hand resting on my treat pouch because then the dog or cat or whatever you're training, is just going to be focused on your hand and when your hand's going into that treat pouch. So for the most part, try and keep your hands just by your sides and neutral. And the very first behavior I ever teach an animal is for them to look at me and to get good eye contact from them because if you can't get their attention, then you can't train your animal at all. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I might just wait for my dog to look at me up in my face. I might point to my eyes. If I, they make good eye contact, I'm gonna reward them. Good job. So again, I'm gonna make sure I don't have any extra treats in my hands, neutral, look makes eye contact with me, good. And then I'm gonna give them a treat. Now I used a, what's called a verbal marker by saying good. And that basically just marks the exact moment in time when the animal completes the behavior and then they know that it's gonna be followed up with a treat right after they hear that verbal marker. Some people will use a clicker. There are lots of different types of clicker. This is referred to as a box clicker. When you click it, it makes a very distinct noise and then they know a treat is gonna be followed up with that click. So I'll give him a treat for that. If the box clicker is too loud, sometimes it can make a very sharp noise and startle animals. You don't want your animals to be fearful while you're working with them. They also sound, uh, make these oval clickers that are a little bit softer in their noise. And when they hear the click, they get a treat. And then another thing that you can do that I'm a big fan of because I've done some marine mammal training and you might have seen dolphin trainers that have whistles they use when they're training animals is um, a dog whistle, but you want to change it so that it's within a hearing range that you can hear. Dogs can hear much higher pitch noises than humans can, but so that you know that you're hearing when you're making the marker, you want to um, untwist it to the level where you can hear it and both you and the dog can hear it. So I'm going to ask Wiley to lay down. This is a behavior he already knows. Wiley down. Ah, my whistle didn't sound there. To use a verbal marker. Good. Let's use my other whistle. Sit. Good. So just so that I'm not confusing people with the jargon and the whistle and the clicker, I'm just going to use the verbal marker. Good for now. Um, but if you have any questions about when or how to use a clicker or whistle while training, I highly recommend it because basically what it does is it marks the exact moment in time when they complete the behavior, but it also allows um, you to uh, be precise and it, it's referred to as a bridge. 
because it bridges the gap in time from when the animal completed the behavior to when they actually get the treat. For instance, if I was asking an elephant to pick up its foot for me, I wouldn't be able to um, potentially be there and get the treat right to that elephant's mouth the second they pick up their foot for me. So that's why using a whistle or clicker or verbal marker is really important because then there's no confusion about when the behavior was completed correctly. So um, once I know that I have good attention from my dog, that I am getting good eye contact from my dog, good, um, I can move on to other behaviors. So um, the most common behavior, the first thing that most people teach their dog is how to sit. Oftentimes dogs just naturally do that for you if you're walking around and they're following you and then you stop for a second, they sit, good. And you can capture that behavior naturally when they do that. Other times you might have a dog that is having a harder time doing it. So you can put the treat in your hands and while they're standing, you can move it over their head. Once they sit, say good, and get the treat. So that's one quick, easy way is using the luring method with the treat to help shape their body into the position you want them to be in. Sit, good. Now, once they know that behavior, you can um, start using the verbal, um, which I like to use the word sit. Other people might use a different hand signal. They might do this. Um, I naturally change my hand signal because I'm already luring with the treat. I might just change the hand signal to go up like that to mean sit. Um, I like to also train my animals how to use a verbal cue and a visual cue. So the verbal cue is sit and the visual cue is this hand signal here. And the reason why I like both using verbals and visual cues when I'm training an animal on new behavior is because as animals age, they might lose their hearing, they might lose their sight. So even though they're getting older, you, it's nice to have uh, something to rely on instead of having to retrain a cue for an animal as they age. So Wiley is actually 14 years old. He is starting to lose his vision and his hearing. So um, if he doesn't respond sometimes, I wonder if he just can't hear me, so I'll say something louder or I might switch to the visual hand signal. Okay, now laying down can be a little bit tricky to teach some dogs. Some dogs just have a really tough time doing that. So I like to start them in the sit position and then I'll lure with the treat down into the ground and into this like slope motion and oftentimes they want to follow the treat like Wiley just did. Not all dogs will do that. Sometimes I've um, had to train a behavior with like little dogs. I might have them sit and then I will take the treat and I'll put it under my leg and have them fall under my leg and to get to the treat, they'll follow you right under your leg to get them into that down position because some dogs will pop right up and start standing and trying to follow and walk to get the treat. Whereas Wiley already kind of knows this behavior, downward sloping motion with the hand in the treat. He's down, I'm gonna give him the treat. So those are two ways you can train the down behavior. Another way is also just to wait for them to kind of naturally lay down on their own, like you what might do with the sit behavior. Um, so that's a great option. Why is being so good? I mean, sorry, Brando, my other dog, I'm patient over here. He's seven years old. I'm gonna give him a treat just for hanging out on the couch and not interrupting the training session. So again, even though it's not a particular behavior that I asked him to do, it is a behavior that I like, that I want to reinforce. So even though it's not trained, I can still give him a treat for behaving. All right, so another fun behavior is the target behavior. And I'll do this with Brando. And the target behavior is basically where he's gonna to touch his nose to my hand. So I'm gonna say target. He didn't quite touch there. Target. And what's nice about the target behavior is that if you have a new puppy or a dog that likes to mouth your hands and is teething, it's a good way to teach them how to interact with your hands without actually using their mouth. If he started to lick my hands, I wouldn't give him a treat. It's only when he gently touches my hand with his nose. Target. Um, so that's a great behavior. It also trains dogs to pay more attention to your hands and hand signals by just training them to follow where your hand is. Target. Now, Wiley isn't as good at this behavior. Target. 
he hasn't done it. So I'm just not going to reward him. I try not to let my dogs fail more than twice in a row before I set them up for another behavior because I want the training session to be fun and entertaining for them. So if he doesn't do the behavior that, and because I thought that he already knew it, but he isn't doing it, that's okay. I'll ask for a sit. Good dog. Can you lay down? Good. Another great behavior to teach your dog is impulse control around food. So I like to train the leave it behavior with food. And the way you start to train this behavior, especially with a new puppy that doesn't have a lot of impulse control yet, is I might put the treat on the ground and I'll say leave it and I'll cover it with my hand. They might go up and start sniffing and pawing at my hands. Um, but it's not until they stop that I'll say good leave it and I'll lift my hand up and then he can go get it. Now as they get better with this behavior, you can make it more challenging. And I'll have one lay down for this. And then I'll say, leave it. And he knows not to get this treat until I say, okay. Now he can go get it. So just teaching your dog that they don't always need to jump or lunge at things they see on the ground. This is handy if you're taking them for a walk and they might see a, a you know, chip bag on the ground or other piece of trash, cigarette butt, and you don't want them to go for it, you can, as you see them wanting to sniff it and maybe put it in their mouth, you can say, leave it. The second they leave it, you want to have that treat ready to give them a treat for leaving whatever else was very interesting and uh, give them a treat for that. And that's a really challenging behavior for puppies that are curious, but the sooner you start practicing that, especially while you're out on walks, um, the more you'll be, you'll be able to set them up for success with other things like maybe a cat or a squirrel that they might be lunging to get um, out on the walk. You can also say leave it and redirect them back to you. So remember to take your treats out with you on your walk um, when you're around the house and you have a new puppy and you want to catch them doing good things or redirect them when they're um, getting into trouble. Um, it's really handy to have them on you. Sit. So when I have a training session with an animal, I try and keep it short, five to ten minutes long. So um, Wiley here is offering a shake behavior, I didn't ask for it. I'm not gonna reinforce it because I didn't ask for it, but um, he does know shake, I'll put my hand out. He picks up his paw and shake that. The way you train the shake behavior is, um, usually what I do is I put my hand down by their foot and kind of gently pull it up with my hands. And then I say, good. Until they start anticipating it and starting to pick up their but on their own, like Wiley just did. And then I give them the treat for that. So that's a cute little behavior, um, little trick, party trick that you can pull out when you have friends over. Um, another important behavior is the come behavior. And I always say it's kind of life-saving, especially if you're out and they, maybe your dog gets out of your house and their car is out, um, you wanna be able to call your dog back to you. So in order to do that behavior to make it much more fun and exciting for your dog, I don't wanna just like stand here and say come. That's not fun and exciting for a dog. I'm actually gonna run backwards and say come. That movement away triggers that chase behavior. Even Brando got excited enough to get up off the couch. I'll tell him to come as well. Brando, come. I'll have them sit. They'll each get a treat for coming. And the last part of the um, come behavior that I always like to reinforce is I like to pet him around the collar. Why do I like to do that? Why is that an important part of the come behavior? It's so that if in an emergency you have to grab their collar because they darted outside or you're trying to leave the dog park, you don't want the, them to anticipate you reaching for their collar and then they're gonna dart away from you because they think it's a game of um, chase or they know that every time that you've called them to you at the dog park, you always leash them off and leave the dog park. That's kind of punishment for a dog. So, um, I recommend if you're going to the dog park with your dogs, um, call them to you multiple times and then let them go, let them run around. Let the uh, ability of just being free and running off leash be the reinforcement. I don't recommend bringing dog treats into a dog park that can trigger a dog fight. Um, so definitely leave your treats at home, but if you need to get your dog to come to you, it's counterintuitive, but actually running away from them come, is much more exciting than um, any other just standing there calling them. So I'm gonna see if Wiley will come. And he knows that when he comes, it's not just to come to me, but to sit. 
because again, I wanna be able to touch him and pat him around his collar. So if I do need to grab it in an emergency, it's no big deal. He's used to it. We practice it inside first, then we'll practice it outside on a long leash. Then we might practice it off leash when I know he's really solid on the behavior. So again, these are just some behaviors that you can start practicing with your dog. The other behavior that also can be pretty life-saving is a sit-stay behavior um, so that they're not darting outside a door. First, I'm just going to practice this standing in front of them. I'm going to tell Riley to sit. He's already sitting. Good dog. I'll give him a treat for that. Then I'm going to tell him to stay. He, when you're starting to train a dog, they may not know what this flat hand signal means. It's just going to be you waiting a couple of seconds and then giving them a treat. If they continue to sit, stay, I might count to four seconds. One, two, three, four. Good dog. And then I'm going to release them with okay. Okay. So that he knows that by getting up, uh, that's the end of the behavior. It's also reinforcing with a dog that kind of is antsy um, and doesn't like to stay, especially young puppies. Just being able to get up and move around is really reinforcing. Another important um, way to practice stay is with distractions. So when I have a dog that's learning this for the first time, I might um, practice just taking a step to the side. So Wiley, stay. And I'm not even moving both feet, good. And then I'm gonna try again. Oh, he moved, so I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna set him back, stay. I'm gonna take a step to the side, good. Give them a treat. And then you can practice taking a step back and then walking up. Good dog. Okay. He knows he can get up. So you can practice it for distance. You can practice it for time. You can practice it for doing jumping jacks. Stay. This is really exciting. Oh, he, he broke because it was just too exciting for him. So I want to set him up for success again. How do I get him from breaking with a certain distraction? Well, I'll break it down into smaller approximations. I'll tell Wiley to stay. I might just move this side of my body. Good. Now I'll move the other side of my body. Stay. Good. Wiley, stay. I'm gonna do a full jumping jack this time. Oh, it was too much. So. Now I might try something else. I'll have him walk around. We won't make this so monotonous. I'll have him lay down. Good. Now I'll have him sit, stay. Now what I might do to help him is I'm gonna hold his collar and I'll just do my feet this time. Stay. Good. And we might try it again, stay. Good. Now we're going to try the whole body. Stay. He slightly moved and then he sat. I'll try it again. Stay. So because he broke twice, I'm just going to um, set him up for success. I'm going to move him again. Let's go. Give him a treat. Coming along. See if he wants to participate again. He still wants to participate. Stay. Oh, stay. Oh, he stayed that time. Good job. And that's because I kept my hand out in front of him. So again, you can break this into different steps, stages. We just want to make sure we're always setting them up for success. And I don't want to ask him repeatedly over and over again and just have him fail over and over again. So. That's pretty much dog training in a nutshell. Um, are there are other resources I want to share with you real quick before um, I let you go that include enrichment. So not everything has to be a formal training session um, for dogs to really thrive in your home. Obedience is really important, um, but there are other things that you can do to keep them mentally stimulated if you're at work or if you're on all these Zoom meetings that everyone's on right now. Um, I love these puzzle feeders. They're made by Outward Hound. I'm not paid or endorsed by any of these companies to recommend these products, but they're what work for me and my dogs at home. Um, there are these different, um, basically, dog dishes that you can put their dog kibble in or their wet dog food in. And it basically, all the ridging in here slows them down so that they don't inhale their food. 
You could also um, put a little bit of peanut butter in here and freeze it. That also is fun for them. Again, they come in all these different shapes and sizes. We even use these at the zoo with some of our animals as well. Just something mentally stimulating and different for them. So that if you want them to, again, um, not inhale their food or have another enriching experience for them, um, it's a great option for them. Um, another great thing that I recommend for people with dogs are um, these harnesses. Um, they're great, for instance, Riley being 14 is kind of a geriatric dog. He has spondylosis in his spine, which is just arthritis of his spine and his neck in his mid-thoracic region. So um, by putting this harness over his head, it actually distributes a lot of the weight when he's around walking, so it doesn't pull on his neck. And he's pretty good about walking calmly on the leash. He will get distracted by some joggers and other people and sometimes try and, and bark and we try and have our treats with us to set him up for success for that. Um, but again, it's great for elderly dogs, these type of harnesses, or small breed dogs like miniature poodles or um, Sharpe, it's not, sorry, um, Shih Tzus. Uh, they can be prone to what's called a collapsing trachea, so you don't want a lot of pressure on their neck because then they have a hard time breathing. So certain small toy breeds, um, I recommend harnesses instead of a normal flat neck collar. If you have um, a medium to large size dog that likes to pull a lot and you're still working on a leash, um, loose leash walking, um, this is called an uh, easy walk harness. And it basically goes over their head and then, you get right now, come off the couch here for a second. Um, behind their front legs, it clips on the side of their body. And by having the clip here at the front of their chest, as they pull, it kind of pulls their body back around to you without causing any pain around their neck or their rib cage. Um, so if he does get out ahead of me and really wants to pull, he's about 35 pounds, um, he, his body's redirected back to me. So again, it, I highly recommend practicing the loose leash walking and healing behaviors while you're out on your walk, but of course they're not going to get it right away. So in the meantime, if you need something in a pitch, those harnesses are great. Um, another brand that I recommend is for leashes, Lupine. They are guaranteed for life, basically. Even if your dog chews on them, they'll replace the leash for you for free. So I love that brand. Or just having a really great leather leash, it's easy on your hands. Um, also another great product that lasts a really long time. Lastly, I have some books here and toys that I want to recommend. Let's see. So this is referred to as a Kong. It's a really popular dog toy. It's a thick rubber. The black Kongs are even heavier duty if you have like a pit bull at home that has really strong um, jaw or a German Shepherd or Rottweiler. Um, uh, you would want to get the black variety of this, and it's a larger size, but I will actually fill the inside of this with peanut butter or wet dog food and then freeze it. And then before I leave for work, my dogs get one of these to kind of, one, give them something to do when I leave, two, it also calms them. So the act of licking and having to lick the peanut butter or wet dog food out of the Kong um, helps them from becoming anxious before I leave. I want to mitigate any sort of separation anxiety if you've been at home for a while due to COVID and anticipate potentially having to go back into the office, practicing being out and going for a walk maybe by yourself while leaving your dog at home so they get used to you not being home anymore, that's also something that you're going to want to try and mitigate is, um, you know, them getting used to having you out of the house for longer periods of time than maybe what they're used to currently. Um, there are these great dog toys that are made out of fire hose now. They have speakers in them. Um, this one has a little rattle in it and a squeaker. Um, so these um, plush toys are really popular with dogs. They really enjoy them, but they often don't last because the material they're made out of. So the ones that are made out of the fire hose tend to last a bit longer. And then if you don't happen to have one of these um, puzzle feeders at home, you can use something like a muffin tin to spread their dog food out in, um, in a pinch. Most people have muffin tins they're not using. They could put dog food in and it takes them a while to eat out of all the different little compartments. And then lastly, I have some common dog grooming tools. If you have a short breed, um, a short haired breed dog, then you don't really have to worry about this as much. If you have something like a golden doodle or a spaniel, they have a much longer coat. So 
Um, just getting them used to brushing is important. Lots of dogs get fearful and or aggressive when you brush them because it's scary or uncomfortable. So one way you can practice it at home is actually with a treat. I might brush a couple of times, and if he's calm and stays still, then he gets a treat. Same thing with checking in their ears. Spaniels can be prone to ear infections due to their long floppy ears. Just letting me look in his ear, he's really good for that, he gets a treat. Same thing with looking in their mouth, checking their teeth. Dental disease is a big issue with dogs as they age. Just being able to look in their mouth with them being calm is great. You can get a treat for that. So again, just desensitizing your dog to things that the vet's gonna wanna do. It's always awesome when a vet can look at your dog, check their paws out, their whole body, without having to sedate them. Because anytime you have to sedate an animal for a veterinary exam, there's risks involved with sedation, just like humans. So um, we wanna prevent that as much as possible by keeping it a positive experience, take their treats with you to the veterinarian. And again, if you have any extra questions, um, I'll post my email address at the end of this. Feel free to email me. And then there are some great books out there on dog training. Dog training has come a long way in the past 20 years. My absolute favorite is Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. She runs the Karen Pryor Clicker Training Academy, which is great. Dogs are checking out other dogs out my window here. So I'm going to try and make sure they aren't barking during this. Hey, Brando. Um, what Shamu taught me about life, love, and marriage. This is a really fun book because it talks about animal training as it relates to... <laughs> See, my dogs aren't perfect either. <laughs> we still bark at distractions and other dogs outside sometimes. Thank you for not barking. I'm coming. Thank you. So this book here is awesome because it talks about even training your spouse at home. So if they're leaving their dirty socks around and you want to change that behavior, um, this is a really fun book. It also talks about training in the zoo and aquarium world and how it's um, really been um, pioneered by a lot of dolphin trainers and they, they do a lot of amazing stuff with their animals. It's all positive reinforcement training and it all applies to children, adults, um, or any animals you might have at home. Clicker training for books. As you heard me talking about the clickers, um, this breaks it down even more. This is also a Karen Pryor book. The Culture Clash by um, Jean Donaldson, awesome book about just misconceptions between humans and dogs and how they interact with one another. Uh, this is Reaching the Animal Mind by Karen Pryor. Why leader you're in my way. Um, the Power of Positive Dog Training. This is by Pat Miller, she's an awesome dog trainer. This is a fun book I actually just picked up at Home Depot actually. 51 puppy tricks. If you have a new puppy at home and you want to train them a bunch of fun behaviors, that's always nice. Um, Wiley here can be reacted to other dogs while on leash, meaning he will lunge and bark when he sees other dogs on leash. Um, so we've done a lot of training to uh, mitigate that behavior with him, and a lot of it is broken down in this great book, which is called Click to Calm, Healing the Aggressive Dog. Um, so if you have a dog that is um, has a hard time meeting other dogs while on leash. For instance, I can take Wiley to the dog beach or the dog park and he's fine off leash. But there's something about being constrained on a leash that um, makes dogs defensive. They can't express their full body language like they would. They can't retreat like they normally would be able to off leash. They feel confined. So um, basically they felt like their best defense is a strong offense. Um, so Emma Parsons has written this book and it's great about working with a dog that can get um, over threshold and worked up in certain situations. And this is probably, I would call the Bible of dog training. This is like a textbook. And it's Animal Training by Ken Ramirez. I've done a lot of seminars with him and he is fabulous. If you wanted to do one of his animal training seminars, um, they're taught usually out in Seattle, but um, he does a lot of virtual training online too. Um, so if you're really into animal training and you really want to learn a lot as it relates to training in zoos, aquariums, and with dogs, I highly recommend Animal Training, this textbook by Ken Ramirez. So that's everything. It's probably gone way longer than 20 minutes, but um, again, uh, my name's Gabby Munoz. I work for the San Diego Zoo full time. I, um, before this was the canine behavior manager at a large private animal shelter called Wayside Waves. 
and I also have my certified professional dog training knowledge assessed certification, which is a, a written exam that dog trainers who are positive reinforcement dog trainers have to sit for to get a certain national accreditation. So that's a little bit about me, class of 2007, love Bates, hope to hear from you guys, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the fall. I'm here in San Diego where we don't have a lot of great foliage, but enjoy all of that for me if you're out in New England. Thanks. Bye.